Master, Master. What? Oh, you know, the while I'm working. oh yes, Master. But I was wondering, what were you making, Master? Our next review. Our next one, Master. What's the next review? We weren't going to do that. Yes, sir. Of course we're doing it. Yes, Master. Yes. Is it safe? Is it safe? No. Shall we review it now, Master? Yes, Master. I get everything prepared. Hello, internet viewers of the internet. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Ruby Stein. And her lovely assistant, Igor. Love me in certain words. Oh, we're all lovely in our own way, Master. You told me. Mm. Today, we are here to review another friendly sign. Oh, yes. Very, very nice. What is it, Master? Bride of Frankenstein. Oh yes, the bride, the bride. Perhaps it's time we explain some history to the lovely viewers. Indeed. So, after the smash success of Frankenstein, and also the Invisible Man, right, Master? Yes. James Whale was considered a very hot commodity for Universal. Indeed. Mm. And so, the producers wanted him to make a sequel to his um, beloved Frankenstein movie. Yes. And he thought he'd expand a little bit on the little subplot from the original book. Yes, things that they left out originally. Especially the scene where the, where the good doctor has to create a mate for the monster. Exactly. Mm. Now, speaking of the original book, that reminds me of the opening for the movie, pretty much. Yes, this opening is Quite interesting. We see a dark and stormy night on Lake Geneva. And on Lake Geneva, we see a gathering of friends there. Who are these people, Master? Lord Byron. Ooh, Lord Byron. Ursinus Shelley. Mr. Shelley, yes. And Mary Shelley. Mm, they include the good writer as well. Indeed. And they give a little history of what we saw in the first film, and then expand upon that. Mm, it's the old master. To them, which we cut to the film itself. It's the ending of the film with the giant fire at the windmill. Yes, and everyone is returning home with the good doctor, who is severely injured. And he's once again played by the same actor from the first one. Indeed. Mm. Actually, he's one of the only two actors from the original that show up here pretty much. Pretty much. Besides the monster and for some reason another actor which we'll get to later. Yes. What are they going to do to the good doctor though? They were taking him home, but they first thought they were, he was dead. But no, he's just not unconscious. And for some reason they recasted his beloved Elizabeth. It's... They don't even have a blonde actress to want her again pretty much. But are the Vivid people not mad at the good doctor? Not really, for some ungodly reason. Mm, do you think they'd be a little mad at the monster that killed a couple of their villagers last time? Especially since he's the one who created it. Mm. Speaking of the people that the monster killed, we then cut to the papa of the little girl from the first film. Yes, and the mother. Which is weird because they're both played by different actors this time, pretty much. Why are they there at the house? Hans is not convinced that the monster is dead until he sees this blackened skeleton. And as he's poking around and looking around, he unfortunately falls through the wreckage of the burning collapsed window. 
And goodness, there just happens to be no little water pool for underneath the windmill. Which is bizarre. Mm. Anyways, then we find out that the monster has actually survived. You can't just kill Frankenstein like that. It's not that simple. No, unfortunately not. So, he kills both Hobbs and his wife. So he killed the whole family now. They join together in heaven. Amen. So, the monster then parades through the woods. But first we come back to the doctor and his wife. And they, we find that they have a late night visitor. Yes, who's visiting the doctor? A man named Dr. Precarious. Oh, he sounds like a very trustworthy man. Not really. You can always trust a man with a name like that, basically. Not really, but... It's that. And he basically comes to the good doctor and begs him to do the experiment once more. I think Dr. Precarious may be based on the character from the book. There's, there's a doctor who mentors Victor when he was at Ingolstadt, but he actually doesn't want him to go through with it, because he was very close to making his own creature like that many years ago. Yes. And in one version, he's even played by Sir John Cleese also. But in this one, he actually wants to go through with it, the doctor. Of course he does. But he's, the good doctor is not convinced. No, he's giving up that right for his beloved. But the doctor persuades him to come, and he joins him at his house, where he shows them something very peculiar. Yes, this was the part of the book where Mary Shelley was high on the rope, you know, I bet. Yeah, this wasn't even in the original. Oh, it wasn't? Then why did they include it? So, we open up with a little child's coffin or something like that? Yes, I assumed that it was going to be like a child that was murdered or, or something like that, but no, in fact, they're little jaws filled with tiny people. But how did he make them, Doctor? He made them apparently like a little seed or something. Which doesn't make sense, though, Doctor. It doesn't at all. And they're so random. We have a queen. And the king, who looks an awful lot like King Henry VIII. And then an archbishop, a devil. A mermaid, and a ballerina. Yes. It's very interesting. It's kind of random, but it's kind of funny at the same time. It, it is, because the, the, the king wants his queen desperately. I don't think that's a good idea. We all remember what happened with the last time King Henry VIII wanted a wife. But there is something interesting about this scene. It kind of makes it look like instead of just abandoning his creature like Henry did, Productive Restories took the time to nurture and create these monsters, basically. In some way, yes. And, and he pers tries to persuade him to build another one, a, a woman. A female Frankenstein monster. Exactly. The only interesting thing I can say about this scene is that we get that infamous line pretty much, Master. Mm. How does it go again? Well, I know how it goes, I know how it goes. Can I say, Master, please? Fine. Oh, thank you, Master, thank you. To a new age of gods and monsters, which unfortunately was used in that very terrible Tom Cruise mummy movie, unfortunately. We're not going to get into that. Oh, I'm sorry, Master, I'm sorry. Speaking of um, creatures from other movies, Una, Una O'Connor is also in this film as well. Yes, it's nice to see her again. She plays Minnie, the house uh, maid or something like that. And we get the infamous Una Connor scream in that film as well. Yes. Oh god, this is Una Connor. She is the best in this, pretty much. And then we see that the monster is rampaging throughout the woods. And with a different burgomaster this time. Yes. He is captured and put into jail, but not for long, before breaking out. And before he was captured, he also tried to save a lady from drowning, unlike last time, pretty much. Yes. And he gets shot in the arm like he does in the book, pretty much. Indeed. And what does he do when he's done rampaging in town, Master? Hmm? What does he do when he rampages from town? He kills people. He kills a little girl, I think. He kills another little girl. That's twice now. And some other people as well. Mm. 
Or I don't think he kills, maybe he just beats them at night. And while that's going on, he escapes into the woods next. And then we hear the sweet sounds of a violin. Oh dear lord, it's um, Gene Hackman. Don't get gross, Mr. Monster. He's going to spill the soup on your lap. We see that his character was a blind man. Which is interesting, because there's also a blind man in the book that's going to come to Yes, I know. Doesn't he have a family, though, or something? He has a family in the book. Which is weird. Why did they make him alone in this one? I'm not sure. Isn't he kind of weirdly dressed? It looks like he's dressed like a monk or something. I believe that maybe he was. There's another weird Christian symbolism in this film, isn't there, Maestro? It is. So he hears the music, he goes near, what does he do? He goes inside the hut. But since the man cannot see him, he cannot see that he is the form of the monster. It would be a frenzy. Yes, the monster needs a friend. He gives him some food to eat. And then a bed rests on. And he prays for him pretty much. Yes. To the point to where both of them are crying with happiness. I always like this scene the most. Yes, I admit it's rather touching. All he ever just wanted was a friend. Someone to love. Someone to care for. So then we find out that the monster has been able to learn some words. He's been taught by the good blind man in this one. Yes, he learns how to say bread, wood, wine. Wine. Wine always good. Smoke. He's getting high, unfortunately, I bet. Mm. I'm surprised we don't see any smoke coming out of his neck wood. I wish they'd done that. That would have been a cool effect. That would have been pretty cool and funny. Anyways. And we get the old infamous line, fire bad. Yes. He doesn't say it quite like that. He says fire no good. Mm, it's one of those things. But, unfortunately, it doesn't last very long, does it, Master? No, the two wanderers who are lost in the woods come in and ask for directions. Mm. And unfortunately, they find out. They see the monster, and they're going to take a shoot, like this Franken dog right here. I don't think it may be. Yes, it's our good Frank and me. I'll feed her later, Master. So unfortunately, they take the blind man away while this hut is burning to the ground. And Frankenstein is all alone again. He just wanted a friend. That's all he ever wanted. It's very sad. He even scares little children away, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And then we see the monster in a graveyard. Yes. I have a feeling Tim Burton may have taken something from this. It does look very much like something from Frank. To be fair, though, people have been ripping off that scene for centuries, it feels. Indeed. So, the monster hides from the angry mob, and he sees Dr. Pastorius in the little sarcophagus area, sort of thing. Yes, in a little mausoleum, where they're digging up the skeleton of a woman. I think she was like a baroness or something. I believe so. Or perhaps the daughter of a baron? Daughter of a baron, or something like that. Mm. She was quite young. But for some reason, it says she died in 1899, yet her corpse is very well preserved. It was skeleton. Mm. But the, the point is, we get another cameo from another actor from the first film, pretty much. Yes, it's good old Fritz. But how? He's died in the last one. How is he here? This one, his name is Carl. So wait, he brought back the original actor, but he's just playing a different character? Yes. It's a bit weird. It doesn't matter. Oh! Sorry, man. Oh! So, Frankenstein meets Dr. Um, Polius. Mm. And he basically says, How would you like a mate? Mmm. Mate? Good. And this gets him rather excited. Oh, yes. There's nothing more dangerous than a horny monster. Mm. So, we cut back to Frankenstein himself, the good doctor. He's not a lot in this film, is he? No, not really. It's mostly focused on the creature, pretty much. I kind of like that approach. It does make it for a more interesting viewing. So, 
the doctor has decided no, he refuses, and he's going away with his new baroness because they finally got married. Finally, it took them long enough. The doctor Curious does not want any of this, and he brings the monster in and frightens him. I got to admit, Doctor Curious's costume is a bit weird. It looks like a cross between a mad scientist and a mad preacher, almost. Anyway, kind of makes him look like a cardinal. But now the monster is threatening his creator to make him a friend. And he still refuses, even with the threatening, so the monster steals Elizabeth. You'd think she would have seen this since this happened literally in the last movie. Well, apparently she doesn't expect it coming. They never do. And of course we get another Una Connor scream, pretty much. Indeed. They try to go um, to the authorities to find her, but Dr. Curious stops them in the tracks. He threatened them, right? Yes, he says if you wish to see the Baroness return, you will do absolutely nothing. So, the monster takes Elizabeth over to the cave to hide, basically. Yes, and the Doctor and Carries return to the uh, abandoned room then. Well, not the abandoned room. No, the abandoned lighthouse. Pretty much. It's the same set as the last movie. Yes. Except this time they're given it a bit of an upgrade. More gadgets this time. And they're now working on a heart. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. But wait a minute. How did he um, get the hearts exactly? I think it was artificially made. Artificially made hearts? The same with the brain though, right? Yes, but the artificial heart didn't make it. And so they need a new one. A fresher one. And then Carl is forced to get a heart from another person. Yes. And it doesn't show it, but I think he basically stabs a woman to death and rips out her heart. Pretty much. <laughs> yes, it's quite unsettling. But this one is a good heart, and it works. Mm. And they prepare for the... Well, they, they prepare the body for the electricity. Exactly, which takes a bit more longer than usual. But... There is um, the one good thing I've got here. Uh, once again, Carl, or Fritz, or whatever he wants to be called, gets killed by the creature again. Yes, he's strung off the lighthouse. They never catch a break, do they? No, not really, no. And then we finally get to see the female creature. Yes, the infamous scene where we see her. Oh yes, the actress does a really good job convincing us that she's a, you know, a minute creature just learning everything. She was just born. Pretty much. Which is weird, because in the book, Frankenstein is about to create the monster, but then he kills her at the last minute because he's terrified of what happens if they create an army of monsters like that. Exactly. Even though what Frankenstein just wanted was to take her away to South America, where they could hide away, basically, from the world. Yes, I know. Unfortunately, she's not really attached. She's downright terrified of him. Well, she's terrified because she just... Oh, she still doesn't know everything. If they gave her a few days, maybe she could warm up to the monster. Yes, but unfortunately, Frankenstein is a bit impatient. He, she thinks he hates him. So, he's about to hold the switch. Yes, apparently this castle has a self-destruct switch for some reason. Mm. But somehow Elizabeth broke free from the cave. But how? I'm not sure exactly. Maybe that thick bat that was flying around was actually Dracula. So, Frankenstein bids the good doctor goodbye. Tells Notorious he will stay. He will stay, they, yes. For they belong dead. And he pulls the switch, killing both himself, the bride, and the doctor. Which is weird, for a movie called Bride of Frankenstein, she's only in the last scene of the movie. Yes, it's rather... ridiculous. Yeah, it's still better than that one we got with Jennifer Beale, at least. Let's not talk about it. And then the film ends. Mm, it's a little shorter than the last one, almost. Yes, and for him, a movie that is called The Bride of Frankenstein, she's not really in it. However, the movie is a bit of an improvement for the first one. That's true, for they added more from the story. Yeah. And we get more scenes with the creature again. Yes, and it is rather nice that we can hear him speak for once. 
Boris. Yes, apparently Boris Karloff likes this one a little better because in this one they allowed him to speak actually and it allowed him to express himself in a more sort of a way that didn't rely just on facial movements. Yes, indeed. You can almost argue that this movie added more character to him almost. It did. And it showed that he was slowly lonely. And he was still lonely. Yes, terribly lonely. That's what we like about those films. The monsters were more like victims than, vi than villains, really. Because in most of the cases they were. Mm, yes, yes. So, the rating. Mm, what would you say, Master? I will say that it is rather short, simple, but it's rather nice. And with some scenes that are left questioning, it's still a very iconic movie. I am going to be fair and give it a sucked out. Okay, okay. Well, I like to say that I wish the movie included more of the bride, maybe much. Yes. If they focused on maybe the relationship between her and the creature, we could have had a pretty interesting film, pretty much. Indeed. Kind of like a shape of water, but for Frankenstein, in a way. Yes. But as it is, this film is very, very interesting. It has a lot of weird ideas, the camera angles are quite interesting for me, and it's got a lot of Christian symbolism, which I actually think is pretty appropriate for this film. Well, it's about tempting with God's work. Exactly, Master. And plus, we get to have the creature given some really fine performances in this. Indeed. So I have to give this a seven and a half of the film. Very well. Well, that is the review of the Bride of Friends. Well, we can like and share. Yes, and we can have people to share this with their friends. And leave a comment down below. And hit the bell for notification. And also check us out on both World Film Studios and Silverstone Productions. And if they want to check our social feed, there's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if they want, they can even request some more films for us to do master. Absolutely. And until then, this is Ruby Stein, Dr. Ruby Stein. They're lovely to see the new door. Assistant. Oh, don't be one this time, please. Oh! Sorry. Goodbye. Oh. We should get ready on the next one, Master. Yes.